Sarah Badwe here from Horse Racing Nation. Pleased to welcome on Maggie Wolfendale from the uh, Naira Circuit, Fox Sports Paddock Analyst and Host. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk about some of these final Breeders' Cup prep races going on at Belmont at the Big A. Thank you for having me. Um, really looking forward to getting in to the races with you and to, to watch them unfold this weekend. So uh, a lot of uh, good racing coming up. And you've been having some rain over there in New York. Do you feel as though that's going to have any impact on the weekend turf races coming up? Do you feel like we've seen the worst of it already? What are your thoughts on the weather? It's going to continue to dry out. We've had two really good days despite having six days of rain. So yes, they were very, um, I would say soggy. And we're going to find out a little bit more as we have two races carded for today um, and, and to see how they play, which might give us a little inkling of how the races might play out tomorrow. But again, like I said, we're going to continue to have drying out conditions. So hopefully we'll be back to a, a good course by tomorrow. And that's a good Thing to hear because we do have some turf races that we're going to be talking about with the first one being that grade one Joe Hirsch turf classic that's going to be a mile and a half turf race so for those marathoners and I feel like the main storyline here is Warlike Goddess taking on the boys for the first time in her career what do you think about that? Well I feel like we have two horses coming in off of some subpar um <laughs> rides from Joel Rosario, which, you know, you, you get sometimes with him, but often you do get, you know, flawless rides. But I think connections too have somewhat become obsessed with getting this Philly cover. And um, because of the fact that she gets headstrong and they want her to track behind a horse. So she comes off of it just a bit. And obviously, so she has finished, but I feel like she has finished, even if she's fighting the rider a little bit early on it's just her um so we're gonna see jose lascano climb aboard for the first time and like i said she can be a little bit on the tricky side the thing is though is there isn't apparent speed other than bye bye melvin to her inside so i would think the game plan would be to have her kind of tuck in and i'd honestly say i'd love to see her just right behind the pace i think that should complement her uh the best because that's how you're going to beat Gufo is to beat him to the punch because he's a horse that needs his ride timed perfectly. And also he needs things to maybe melt away a little bit up front. And it was an, I don't know necessarily what happened last time at Kentucky Downs. I feel like often I'm saying what happens at Kentucky Downs needs to stay at Kentucky Downs because it can be <laughs> such a tricky racetrack um, to ride, to run over, you know, horses see big open space and sometimes they get a little free running. And I think that's what happened with Gaffo because he was uncharacteristically headstrong early on in that turf cup where he was upset that day by a red night. And then, you know, halfway in the latter half of the race, he gave up position and you know lengths to red knight um so i think that kind of led to him not being able to quite get his nose in front so again another horse that's going to pick up a new rider for the first time so that raises question marks as junior alvarado has never ridden him joel's Rosar rosario has ridden him pretty much throughout his entire career and has gotten to know him and like i said he's not a very easy horse to ride so it's fun it's gonna be fun to watch this race to see who relaxes, who gets the best trip, um, or it could just go to Bye Bye Melvin, who I feel like is in raging form right now, coming back off that long layoff as a gelding, and maybe he runs away with this, as last week when we had rain, sorry, I'm like going on forever, um, <laughs> last week we had rain, and horses over a course that uh, was a little bit uh, on the wetter side, horses forwardly placed did do best. Well, we're here to hear you, not me. So that works out perfectly because everybody's tired of hearing me at Horse Missing Nation. You are the guest. So your opinion is what we're here to listen to. You read my mind. It's really the rider switch from Joel Rosario to somebody else for these two horses that are pace compromised going into this race that I think that I don't know about the ride on Gufo as much as that's just a trickier horse, like you mentioned, and he really needs everything to go his own way and set up perfectly for him. I don't like to jockey bash, but I think the ride in the flower bowl, there, there were some decisions that were made that were probably not the best. Um, and it's not as though Joel Rosario is uh, a bad rider at, by any means. He's obviously extremely accomplished. He makes very smart decisions the majority of the time. But 
what were what were we supposed to do taking her that far back off of a horse that was obviously going to have a pace advantage in Virginia Joy and I mean she was clearly much the best in there to be that far back kind of get sandwiched in between those horses come late with a run like she always does she is four for four at this mile and a half distance I think that she can obviously compete with the males in here but I like you, I see Bye Bye Melvin as possibly being the one to just run away with this race. He is trying the distance for the first time. He's come back as a, a four-year-old with a great form. He's obviously got the pedigree to excel at these longer distances, being a half to mean Mary, who we saw as a multiple graded stakes winner at a mile and a quarter to a mile and a half. Um, and speed is just so dangerous in these New York turf races. And uh, being someone that's there, you must get so frustrated all the time by the lack of aggressive riding early to have these paceless races kind of develop. And maybe Bye Bye Melvin is just the one that takes advantage of the circumstances that are laid out for him in here. I, you know, yes, I get, I get frustrated with, with people not being more aggressive too. And this, um, this is on the inner turf course having position and saving ground is so essential. And I get even more frustrated when a whole, like you have an opportunity to tuck in, get your position going forward, tuck in. And it drives me insane when they're just out in no man's land, restraining their horse off of 25 or 26 and 50 and, and you know, 52 um, to the half. So it, yes, it, it does get frustrating. And we see with a lot of riders out of town going to Keeneland this weekend and even out to California that uh, we're going to have some, some new faces on horses that aren't easy to ride. We even see Fergal Lynch coming in who has, albeit ridden by, by Melvin. So we'll see what he does uh, here on the Belmont at the big A stage. It'll be an interesting race for sure. And I think has some Breeders' Cup implications, even though it's not necessarily a win and you're in. Was there anyone else in this field that caught your attention? I feel like that's kind of the big three that uh, I, I see as the contenders. Uh, yeah, I, um, I suppose maybe Soldier Rising gets a little attention. It's a, he's a horse that you know, Chris Alcaman and Connections have always had high hopes for. Then they kind of had to regroup after that three-year-old campaign and he does have a little hang in him, which I don't love, you know what I mean? So, and he ran his best race last time out from a figure standpoint in that sword dancer, but that probably more or less was a product of who he was running with. I thought he just kind of ran on, you know what I mean? It, it wasn't, he had a good trip. He kind of sat a similar trip to Gaffo and he's just third best. Um, so maybe he gets attention. Maybe people think that he's kind of on the upswing, but I, 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 don't necessarily trust the figure. I feel as though he's probably a, a mid to high nineties horse that that was just a product of who he was running with that day in the sword dancer. Um, so two, you, you kind of, maybe you give Adamo a look in that he was wide um, that day a little bit, but I, I've never really been as big as fan. So yeah, I think we covered the main three. <laughs> All right, great. We are on the same page there. We'll switch gears and talk about a race that's happening on Sunday. It's going to be the fraternity stakes for the two-year-olds. This is a win and you're in for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. This does also include a filly taking on the boys, just like the other race that we talked about in the Joe Hirsch Turf Classic. Uh, I went to the two Nagarok in here. This is a horse that We've seen two races from him. In the first race at Horseshoe Indianapolis, we saw him break okay and then kind of sit mid-pack before making a run at a horse that was going to be a long shot winner in Balakazoo. That horse paid 70 something dollars to win that day. He ended up having to go wide and kind of out in the middle of the track in the stretch and there. But then we saw a different dimension from him last time out when he broke his maiden at Belmont at the Big A. So I like that he does have a win over the course and distance. We saw him just go to the lead and just keep going and was always very well clear. So I saw the progression from the first start to the second start in terms of figures, which I like to see. I saw two different dimensions and ability of running style. So I like that he's adaptable. I like that he can break quickly and have the speed if he needs it. I like that he can sit off and make a run if he needs to do that as well. I just kind of saw this as being a very mature horse for this stage in the game for the two-year-olds and having shown that versatility. Uh, where did you go in this race? I mean, I was fairly, yes, I like Najarak, Najarak, <laughs> Johnny I and I were just discussing on how to pronounce it because clearly it's, it's Corrigan backwards. Um, and he's like, should I say Cor 
it backwards <laughs> Oregon. I'm like, no, I think you're fine at calling it um, Nazarok. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm actually fairly intrigued by Inflation Nation. Um, I know he looks a little bit slower on, on paper, possibly, but I just feel like Christoph Kaman is going to bring him um, along and he's just kind of that true out and out uh, sprinting type sometimes too um, Graham motion I mean it's more of a negative stat when he's stretching them off off of a win um, you know going short and then stretching them out um, but sometimes they just don't necessarily run back to those figures and so I feel like you know inflation nation has had that race to regress a little bit and I think he could move forward from that so I thought he was probably um, the other horse in here and then you have to as you mentioned the Philly against the boys determined jester who broke her maiden in a stake against the boys last time out at colonial um we'll see she is cross-centered um where she decides connections decide to uh, run her um but i i think that she makes a lot of sense in here to be quite honest I mean, they may opt just to run her Saturday. So we'll see what happens with her. And then Gaslight Dancer, who just romped going to seven furlongs, which, as I said, I never know how to read Kentucky Downs form because it feels like some horses love it and some horses hate it. And how is that going to translate to here? Kind of an odd, odd campaign or, you know, young campaign for this horse and that he was up at Saratoga. They chose him chose to take him back to Churchill for, you know, the quasi Arlington million day with no turf. And maybe they thought he, he was going to run on the turf because he's a Kentucky bred. And then they decided only to have the two races on the turf. And um, so I, I don't, I don't know how to read this horse, but they paid quite a bit for him um, for a freshman sire. He gets a rat or tease today. And it's Mike Maker someday, I should say. Um, so he's going to be one that I'm going to watch in the paddock. If I really like him in the paddock, I feel like I feel confident in taking him. I didn't know what to do with him either. And I feel like he's going to take money just based on the connections and the, sure. the, the romp at Kentucky Downs, uh, which was impressive. And he was also breaking from post 12 in there. So having to be kind of out in the middle of nowhere and then cross over and clear. And he was always very comfortably safe in there. Um, I like the filly a little bit too. I mean, she's quick. She really drew away from the field at Colonial. She was 35 to one that day. I like that she sat off the speed and then when they said go, she went. Um, I think that she's got a shot. I don't love the practical jokes on the turf, but they paid a lot for her too. And she she obviously loves the surface. Um, power it's attack. funny, in my notes, I saw her first time out and she, it, I did say more of a turf hook. So there um, we go. <laughs> yeah, I, I I I agree with you. I wouldn't like the practical jokes in the turf either. <laughs> Looking at the horses in the paddock, obviously that's something that is uh, your niche in the horse racing community. How important is that to you, especially with the two-year-olds, to look at their behavior and how they're developing and their physique? Two-year-olds, I feel as though, is where, you know, observing them in the paddock is the most essential because they're kind of the truest form of themselves where yes, with the older horses and it, it kind of rings true with the, with the, you know, upper level stakes, greatest stakes horses where you can kind of read them and how they look, but two-year-olds you're, you're getting, you know, somewhat of a, a virgin type of product. So how they're acting, what they're, you know, meant to do, you can kind of correlate that to their pedigree and how much fitter they become with start after start and whether they look like dirt or turf horses, so on and so forth, because yes, the older horses um, that are the bread and butter of our, you know, our claiming game and everything like that, they, they might have issues that aren't necessarily apparent or that I can't really comment on either um, that, you know, might lead to a lackluster performance. You know, it, it's so I feel like the two-year-olds are the, the group of in racing that you can truly, um, kind of base an entire analysis on just how they look prior to a start. I think that's a great point to make. And I feel like that's kind of the spot where I feel like I do the best just looking at the horses as far as the maiden races, because I don't know anything about them. And that's kind of nice because I feel like I don't bias myself with what I'm looking at on paper. If I have to talk about a race ahead of time and then look at the horses in the paddock, do you feel as though you end up having that on paper bias sometimes when you look at horses in the flesh or do you, do you kind of like separate? How do you do it? 
depends on the day. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes yeah. like I had one day up at Saratoga where I, I liked horses in the paddock, but I could not fathom them winning on paper. And then they went out there and won. And I was kicking myself like the entire day of why don't you just be true to what you're doing? Um, you know, be true to your purpose here, you know, analyzing races. And I find that when I stick to what I'm seeing, I do better, but it's even more, um, you know, circumstantial or, or, you know, critical, I should say, when they match up when I like a horse on paper and I like them in the paddock or I don't like them on paper and I really don't like them in the paddock then you know that that's that's you know the, the perfect storm but I find for me that holding a horse's form against them in the paddock is often led to disappointing uh, results for myself. Uh, that's a great point to bring up because I feel like too, when you're, you're in that moment trying to give an analysis, there's also a little bit of pressure, right? To sort of have uh, um, something that makes sense to what you saw on paper or something that, you know, you feel as though, okay, well, like this is kind of crazy, but this is how I feel. And this is what I see. Yeah. So like, do I have the confidence to give this out? And for me, at least sometimes the answer is no. And then I kick myself later too. So I'm right. glad that you understand. <laughs> Oh, totally. I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me in my, in my career so far. Um, and I'm, just, I get so frustrated with myself. Like I don't mind taking a shot and being wrong. I mind not taking the shot and then being, you know, right. And, and right. <laughs> right. All right. Well, that is some great insight from you about what these sources look like as well as the races themselves that we covered before we go. I do just have to ask while I have you, what are your Breeders' Cup Classic thoughts so far? I mean, it sounds like Flightline is, is going to make it. I mean, that's the only thing I felt like that got him beat was him not showing up. Um, mm. He's just been brilliant. Um, and I am so happy that they, they ran him um, in the Met Mile because I have my doubts. Now, you always are a little bit doubtful, you know, a horse that's never come out of California, a horse that's never gone, you know, be beyond a sprinter's distance. Uh, he's handled with kick gloves. He doesn't show up. And I now that I've seen him and watched him, I get why he doesn't run that much because it's pure physics. When you're that big and that fast, you know, you're going to end up getting a little body sore, a little, you know, you're going to have your issues. And, and it's purely, you know, you think about humans too. It, it, the more you exert and the bigger you are, the more concussion that your body has to take, the harder it is going to be to recover. So I totally get that. But I also was utterly convinced that going a mile and a quarter isn't going to be that much of a stretch for him. Um, he's a big, strong, as I was saying, animal in that he, he looks as though he can handle it. I mean, you look at life as good. Was he the biggest challenge to him? Not after his last race, uh, going back to the Woodward. So maybe you give a little look at Olympiad, who's one that's proven, who's consistent at least, and has proven that he's he can come with a run. And if things do hit up, heat up and we see a meltdown, then he's going to be the one running late. I think that's a great point that you make about uh, the main competition so far kind of not showing their absolute best like we saw in the Woodward. So I think the conviction that Flightline takes it is just getting stronger and stronger with what we've seen from his uh, main competition so far. But thank you so much for all of your time. I so appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. And where can people find you for the 2% that don't already know? <laughs> <laughs> On uh, Fox Sports two fox sports one um you can always check out our show america's day at the races on youtube as well and um on twitter at maggie wolfendale minus the e in the middle uh so sometimes if i'm not on air i do tweet my thoughts there as well all right awesome well thank you maggie and good luck to everybody this weekend